The Palo Alto Networks Next Generation Firewall has some powerful functions to manage its configuration, but at the same time it can be very confusing if you're used to other firewall vendors. So let me explain you the concept of configuration management so you can make full use of it. If this is your first time here, I'm Lars von Consigas. We call ourselves the Palo Alto Networks Experts because the next generation firewall is our passion. It's what we do all day every day, migrating firewalls, providing managed services and most important, implementing security best practices. When I started to work with this box in 2010, barely anyone knew about Palo Alto Networks. But as an engineer I felt that this solution will change the world of cybersecurity. And yes, today we know it did big time, because it's one of the few security solutions that can truly secure your network. However, there's a caveat. You need to set it up in the right way in order to be effective. Because while it's awesome, it's not a magic box. So over the years we became a professional service partner for Palo Alto Networks, as well as one of a few elite authorized training centers. And with working in the field for so many years and being a trainer, I would like to share my experience with you. So over the next couple of weeks and months, we release new videos and core concepts explaining the fundamental workings of the next generation firewall, starting with the trend landscape, then deployment methods, NAT, AppID, SSL decryption VPNs and many more. So follow us on LinkedIn, YouTube or Twitter to stay up to date. But now let's get started with configuration management. The first thing what we need to differentiate again is remember that on our Apollo Networks firewall we have a dedicated management plane and data plane. So now if you look at, log into the GUI or onto the CLI and do changes to the configuration, all of these changes are done to a config which we call our candidate configuration. And this candidate configuration is, is kind of residing in memory on our management plane. Right? So and again, only once you're kind of happy now here, then you do actually a commit. And with this commit, you will activate your changes right, and uh, install it effectively on a data plane. And with this, they're kind of going into what we call our running configuration. Okay, so now the interesting thing is that when we do a commit, kind of automatically as part of the commit uh, process, right? The firewall will also store what we call a configuration version. So and uh, by default it will store you know up to a hundred configs and that's quite nice because with this you can always revert back to an older config. So having the case for instance you know something isn't working and then you think ah, okay actually maybe this was because of a firewall change. So you but you know kind of let's say last Thursday it was still working. So let's actually revert back to the configuration of last Thursday, right? So you just go onto the firewall and then what you do is you load the config version which was you know committed last Friday. So you do a load. Right? But the important thing here is this load will actually load this com configuration version into the candidate configuration. Right? And then let's say once you're happy that this, yeah, this is the right configuration, then you again do the commit to activate uh, this configuration. Okay? Now talking about reverts, we can also actually revert back from kind of from a running configuration. So let's say you know you are you're in your candidate configuration, you're doing some changes, and then you think, uh, okay, I think I messed this up. Let's just go back to our kind of active running configuration. So here, what you can do is also uh, a revert, and this revert will effectively you know take the latest running configuration and just kind of override the complete candidate configuration and effectively just you know. Uh, puts your running configuration again into your candidate configuration. So beside this, we also then have actually two additional data stores for configuration. Um, the, the next one is what we call a, a named config. And yeah, as the name says, what we can simply do here is we can save configurations under a specific name. So we can do a save, right? And while we do the save, we just, you know, give the config a name, right? And obviously, you know, from this uh, config, we can also kind of load, right? But remember, always when you're loading a config, you always load this into a candidate configuration, right? Um, and the only way you can, how, to, how you can activate a configuration is by doing a commit, okay? So the last config store is what we call a saved config. 
And this one often causes a little bit of confusion. So let me actually give you a use case which probably explains um, this feature the best. So um, happened to me kind of once where I was, you know, installing a new firewall in, in a data center. So I was kind of fiddling along, configuring for a complete hour, right? And then someone was fiddling around with the power, right? And the box went down, boom. Okay, so with this now, what happened was when I do configuration changes to my candidate config, this candidate config just resides in the RAM and the memory on our management plane. Means if the box, you know, if the power goes down, the box shuts down, right? This configuration is lost. Okay, so and, uh, and to kind of overcome these challenges, we have kind of our saved config and. Uh, there isn't really a big difference between name config and a safe config. It's just kind of a way how we can much quicker save your configuration, right? So you kind of here you have kind of an option. I'm going to show you this in a moment where we can simply do a save, right? And this kind of saves the latest candidate configuration in this saved config store, okay? Um, and then from here we can also do uh, a revert, right? To revert back to uh, the latest uh, saved configuration, okay? And by the way, if you're interested in security best practices for Palo Alto Networks, then check out the blog on our webpage. Here in the best practice section, you can download this worksheet with over 120 best practices for the next generation firewall. And very soon, we will also launch a security best practice training with a lot of videos explaining all of these security best practices in detail. So if you're interested, then sign up to our mailing list and we will let you know as soon as this free training is available.